So this is a, a topic that's been talked about at C++ on, uh, on C and here at C++ London before. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about vocabulary types for composite class design. Uh, and so uh, a couple of months ago, we released a new paper, P3019. Uh, and this is the amalgamation of two different papers that previously were, were there for two types called indirect value and polymorphic value. And I'm basically going to be talking about how the designs changed. Uh, we took this to Kona in Hawaii recently to the committee. We got a lot of feedback. That feedback has changed the design. Uh, this I'll update you on. We, we, we've got the design approved, although we still have a few outstanding issues to, to, to look at. But uh, with any luck, this might be going to C++26. So uh, we propose adding two new class templates to the C++ standard library indirect and polymorphic. Both types take a template type T. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Yeah, both take types take uh, yeah, a template type T and now take an allocator. These fill a gap in the existing standard library. So vocabulary types. We refer to standard library vocabulary types such as stood array, stood map, stood optional, stood variant, stood tuple, stood vector as vocabulary types. We postulate that an arbitrary piece of C++ code or application code would make use of some of these existing types. Standardizing vocabulary types is important as it allows different libraries to easily interrupt with users to build applications. The standard library contains other non-vocabulary types to do specific jobs such as interacting with file systems, formatting text, for output or dealing with concurrency. We probably want to standardize both types. So composite classes, we define composite classes as a class with other class instances as members. Vocabulary types can be used to express common idioms. So uh, if we want to express an instance of an object, we just have a T. If we want a nullable instance of an object, we have a stood optional of T. An instance of one of a closed set of types of the set TS is a stood variant of stood of the set of you know, TS. One instance of each of a closed set of types TS is, is a stood tuple. N instances of a type is a stood array of type T with N instances. Variable count multiple instances of type T is a stood vector of T. Unique variable count instances of a type are stood set of t. Key accessed instances of a type t is stood map of key of stood t. So special member functions. Uh, the compiler can generate special member functions. Each special member function can be compiler generated if it's supported by all component objects. So some of you, uh, I'm, I'm hopefully all of everyone here is aware of the rule of zero. Whenever we're building classes, we always want to be trying to encourage the rule of zero. That is, if our classes implement all of the compiler generated special member functions, we get all of our compiler generated special member functions for free. And we tend to get things like strong exception safety guarantees and all of these kind of good things for free without having to implement them. Cons propagation. The compiler will only allow cons qualified member functions to be called on components when they're accessed through the cons access path. We call this cons propagation. Standard library vocabulary types provide cons qualified and non cons qualified overloads of accessors to owned objects to enforce cons propagation. So the kind of canonical example is std vector and its access operator. There's a const and a non const version of that function. If your vector is const and you call it, you'll get the const version of that function. You can't mute, modify the, the variable in that array. If you have a non const reference to it and you, you, you go through that path, you can then modify the underlying type. So requirements for vocabulary types. Composite classes build with, built with vocabulary types should be composable. We want const to propagate, and the compiler can generate all the special member functions where they're defined for an own T. So we get the rule of zero. These requirements make working with C++ easier. Classes should do the business logic or resource management. It should never do both. So we can combine vocabulary types to express combined idioms. So if we wanted to express a verbal count multiple nullable instances of type T, we could have a std vector of std optional of std T. Uh, if you wanted a key access instance of one of a close set of types, we could have std map of key of a std variant of a set of types. 
So incomplete types. We may want to compose or contain an instance of an incomplete type, either directly or for use of existing vocabulary types. Incomplete types support is needed for defining recursive data structures, supporting open set polymorphism, and for hiding implementation details. Incomplete types are supported by storing the object of an incomplete type outside of the composite type. Storing an object outside of the composite type can also be used to optimize ca uh, cache usage. So hot cold splitting, this is where you have a, a data structure where some of those members are gonna be frequently accessed. You want those to fit in onto the main cache line. The rest of the data you want to be put elsewhere because that's gonna be infrequently accessed. So if we want to use incomplete types, uh, we, we need to store pointers. Uh, so we can do this, we can forward declare a type and then we can store a pointer in, in a member and then define that type in the source file. Uh, unfortunately, pointers are a poor fit as we need to implement all the special member functions. We need to manually check const qualification of methods because const does not propagate from a pointer. I'll say that again. When you've got a pointer member in your class, your class can be const, you can own data, you can, you can, you can call member functions that are not const. We see that as a, as a bug in the language. Unique pointers a little bit better. We do not need to implement move construction or move assignment or destruction. The compiler will implicitly delete the copy constructor and the copy assignment operator. Either the composite is non-copyable or we implement the copy constructor and the copy movements assignment operators ourselves. Of course, this, is, this does mean if you want things like strong exception safety guarantees, we have to be very careful about how we do that. Const does not propagate through std unique pointer. So std unique pointer models a pointer, not a value type. And so it doesn't propagate constants because if it did, it wouldn't model a pointer. Const does not propagate through std unique pointer. We must manually check const qualified members for correctness. So that's a very subtle source of bugs. Shared pointers do not model the right thing either. The compiler generated copy constructor and assignment operator will give rise to multiple composite objects that share the same object. So if you, you know, use a shared pointer, you copy it, you now have the reference counter of two, they both point to the same underlying object. One of them modifies it, the other instance has a modified pointer to that data. Const does not propagate through shared pointer. Again, it models a pointer, not a value type. So uh, const does not propagate through shared pointer. We must manually check for const qualified members for correctness. So unique pointers are a little better. Um, we do not need to implement, oh, hang on, that's the wrong way, sorry. Uh, so, okay, so let's try the same thing with const t for shared pointer. So this time we get the compiler generated copy and assignment operators. This gives rise to multiple objects. Now, neither instance can modify that through, you know, because it's got const applied to it. That object is const, you've got two objects pointing to it. That might be fine if you only need to read the data but that doesn't work as soon as you need to modify the data in one of those classes. We cannot call non-const qualified members functions through the pointer now. Part of our com composite is immutable. So uh, we're proposing two new vocabulary types, indirect and polymorphic. Indirect models an instance of an object of an incomplete type of T and polymorphic models an instance of an object from an open set derived from a base type T. Any composite vocabulary type needs resource ownership. It needs destruction and move. It needs deep copies. It needs const propagation. Both of the proposed types, indirect and polymorphic, need indirectly allocated object storage. So um, let's look at something a bit more complicated. Let's look at a, a composite using unique pointer. Uh, if we create foo and foo has two members bar A and B, this behaves like foo that contains two pointers. Okay, we free up the memory, but fundamentally uh, it's modeling this. It's modeling a type containing two pointers. Whereas if you use indirect, what you get is you get a type that models a struct containing two types. So you know, here we have foo with an indirect of bar A and an indirect bar B you're going to get copying working correctly. Uh, you're also going to get deep comparison 
So we provide the comparison operator, which gives you a quality, so it meets the regular requirements. You get const propagation. You get copy semantics rather than move only semantics, and you get allocator support. So let's talk about allocator support for a minute. This example, uh, what we're doing is we're using std scoped allocator. So if you have a std vector, and that std vector contains std string, and you want the allocator to propagate from std vector to std string, and all of those allocations to be allocated from the same pool of memory, this is the way that you do it. You use a std scoped allocator adapter of the allocator, and you pass that in. Now, in this example, what we're doing is we're modeling a situation where we, we want to use, uh, we're using boost into process. So we're using a shared segment of memory between two processes. Boost into process provides an allocator. That allocator allocates shared memories of seg shared segment of memory. Uh, it then overloads pointer semantics with a type called an offset pointer. That means that both processes might have that memory mapped into different locations, but as long as you know it's offset from the base location of that segment of memory, you can access it. This works because just like std vector, std indirect uses the pointer of the allocator type, so it supports fancy pointers. So how has the design evolved? So previously, uh, I said we had we had two other papers. Uh, we had designed these things separately, although they pretty much followed all the exact same patterns, and we see them as a system of related types. So we've combined that paper. Uh, previously, they were called indirect value and polymorphic value. Obviously, we've changed the naming. Uh, previously, indirect uh, was much closer to std unique pointer. So std unique pointer stores a deleter object, which allows you to specify how something's deleted. We followed that pattern. We had a copier, so you could specify how, how copying took place. Uh, and that was great, except we, we originally thought we were supporting allocators correctly. It turns out we weren't. As we learned more about allocators, they're much more complicated than we gave them credit for. Uh, and you actually need to contain the allocator T in your type information of your type. Uh, stood polymorphic value. Uh, you can see we had a constructor that allowed you uh, provide an overload where you could pass in an externally allocated int, so uh, it, uh, externally allocated type of your hierarchy with, with a construct, no, a, a copier and a deleter. Uh, that was very contentious. So this got discussed at the Library Evolution Working Group. Uh, people felt that was very dangerous because you, you know, we didn't know the types were related. We had to do a dynamic type check, and so. We've, we've deleted that. That's no longer supported. So if you want a type created in this hierarchy, it has to be created directly in a, in a polymorphic. You can't take an external type and put it in. You have to put it in a polymorphic, and you have to keep it in a polymorphic as you pass it around. So um, as I mentioned now, the, the allocator is part of the type information that's required to get allocators working correctly. But you can think of these types as a container of one. So other significant design changes. So previously, the, the last iteration of the paper, we modeled these more like pointers. There was a null state. We didn't want to allocate memory all over the place. Uh, we thought we wanted you to control that. Uh, and then what we found is that means, well, what does a std optional of a std indirect mean in that case? You've got, a, you've got a double null state. It doesn't make sense. Actually, the right way to model these things is to model the null state for a std optional of a std indirect or a std optional of a stood polymorphic. There is no null state, so we require that your types are default constructible, or in the case of polymorphic, if you're creating a derived type, that you must pass in the information to instantiate that type correctly at the point that it's created. Uh, but it means that these types will always hold a value, except for one corner case, the moved from state. So um, we'll come back to that in a little more detail in a minute. Um, Another change that was mentioned at the Live Evolution Working Group is that all constructors should be explicit. So we're probably all familiar with the fact that you mark constructors taking in one parameter as explicit. But ever since C++11, you can apply to any constructor the explicit keyword. If you think about the case where you provide uh, square brackets, sorry, uh, square brackets, um, squiggly brackets, the end of a function, you know, it's, it's an initializer list that could be instantiating that type. And by saying explicit, you're saying, I want you to put indirect there because you're doing memory allocation. We don't want memory allocation happening all over the place without you being explicit about it. And that's particularly important when it comes to generic code 
and you've done something for some other type, suddenly you put an indirect there and now you're allocating in a place that you didn't realize you were allocating. Uh, we've provided additional constructors now to support allocators. Uh, we've also provided deduction guides. So ever since C++ 17, we've had deduction guides. Now you can say a stood indirect of and pass in the values to construct it. You don't have to be explicit about saying the type, the compiler will do that deduction for you. And uh, finally, the comparison operators return auto. Although I should have corrected that because actually we've had some discussion around this. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute and we'll talk a bit more about that. But just for the, the, the current status on this is, the, the design has now been approved by LEWG. So there, there's still two remaining issues. One of which is the comparison operator. So returning auto means that whatever your underlying type does for its comparison operators, we forward those, those types. Uh, that doesn't always make sense. Um, we'll, we'll look at that in a second in a bit more detail. Uh, and then finally, the preconditions is a move from state. So just like std variant has a function called uh, valueless by exception. So, you know, the, the, the one way that a, a, a variant can get into an invalid state is it throws an exception and suddenly it has no type in it. You have this function, so you can call that and you can check if it's in a valid state or not. Well, when you move from an object, because you're swapping the contents of a newly constructed object in, we, don't, we haven't done initialization, we were forced with a choice that we either have to do a new and move this newly allocated object into the right-hand side, which breaks the no exception guarantee on the move constructor, which is not something that you want to do because lots of optimizations in the STL rely on that. Uh, we have had to fa favor the providing a, a method on the, on the class that is called valueless by, um, valueless by move. So now if you, you have an object that's moved from, it can get into this state where it's invalid to use. Uh, internally, it just sets the points to null and you can check this. Uh, there's been a, a lot of contention around the design because we effectively said the way we wanted to handle this was if you had a move from object, we didn't think you should do anything with that again. But lots of people in Lou pointed out, hang on, there's loads of STL algorithms like sh random shuffle and things like that, which do expect to be able to do this and would suddenly blow up if we did this. Whether that's something you actually think you're going to do with this or not, I think is, is debatable. Um, I think after some discussion, we're beginning to err on the side of, we'll do some extra work in making sure that that never does blow up. We remove the preconditions. That means a you know there's a small slowdown because you have to do a bit of extra work, but it means that these types are safer. And then finally, coming back to the auto, uh, this led to a big discussion about how every type in the standard should be regular, that lots of containers and algorithms rely on this. Uh, so we had made this effectively forward what the underlying type did. And so uh, one of the members of Lug uh, did a survey on GitHub and looked at um, you know, as many usages of these operators they could find, and they found there was five main categories of these types. Valerie-like containers, where they do element-wise operations, stood simmed, sorry, sim types, where you would want to return a mask object, into returning comparison, which it wasn't really clear what they were doing in a lot of the cases, Expression templates, uh, that's where you want to have objects representing objects, uh, sorry, re representing expressions, sorry. And monotype style APIs. But largely, most of these other cases accounted for about 5% of usage in publicly visible code. Obviously, we don't know what people are doing in their companies and other people, you know, there might be other data points that we don't have. But uh, I think, again, following discussion, we're beginning to come down on the side of just support returning bool, not auto. That means your type is stood regular. Uh, that means, in a way, if we forward comparison operators and we just do whatever the underlying type does, why don't we do this for all other operations? Why don't we do it for plus and minus and every single operation you can think of? It seems reasonable to restrict these to just the minimum subset that the standard library requires. So um, just a, a brief overview about how the proposal pipeline works is you, you take you know, you write a paper, you, you send it to a group, lots of national bodies will look at it and give you feedback. You can take it to a committee meeting and then these different study groups will give you feedback at an early stage of the proposal. We've done that with the pre previous proposals here. Uh, we took this proposal straight to Lug because we'd had feedback on some of these types before. Uh, so as I mentioned, Lug have now looked at this, they've approved the design, except for these two remaining issues that we have to sort out in Telecon before the next meeting. Uh, 
Uh, and we're expecting to take these to LWG uh, in March in Japan, um, in Tokyo. And so if we do that, we're hopeful that we'll then get this forwarded to plenary. That's where proposals get voted on. And that's what when things get accepted into the standard. Once it's accepted in the standard, it gets forwarded for uh, wording and consistency, but then it's just cleaning up and, and tidying. The type is accepted. So uh, finally, um, here's the links to the proposals. So we've got the, the main proposal and also the, the, the previous designs. Uh, but more importantly, we've got an open source GitHub. We're developing this all on GitHub. Uh, we've got lots of the, um, well, we've, we've had developers from GCC and Clang get involved in giving us input at this early stage, which has been phenomenal. Uh, and you can use these types. We have C++ 20 implementations. We also have uh, C++ 14 backwards compatibility implementations. And, uh, you know, these are all under the MIT license. So hopefully that's fairly, you know, unrestrictive. But if people still have cases where their company wouldn't allow them to use it, please come and talk to us. We can always write you custom implementations. We would just love to get feedback and experience from people in using these. Uh, so, um, yeah, please try them out. Give us feedback phase issues on the GitHub, tell us what you think, tell us what you like, what you don't like. Um, you know, now's, now's your chance to, have, to put some feedback in before these get into the standard. Cool, thank you very much.